Good day, everyone. Well, uh, we see the markets are uh, plunging on higher volume, appreciably higher volume, on worries that uh, the Fed's going to raise rates sooner than later uh, due to that wage report that came out today. Um, it shows a 0.7% gain, which is the largest uh, gain since 2008. Uh, but we uh, should keep in mind that markets like to overreact to data, um, especially when it involves interest rates, because that is the, uh, the topic of, uh, of the markets uh, since really 2009 when QE started and um, was able to depress interest rates uh, to unusually low levels. Um, we have to keep in mind that, uh, that the same wage report uh, showed also a 0.6% gain in uh, 2010 and also in 2011 um, during uh, certain quarters. So, uh, you know, th this 0.7% gain could be an overreaction. Um, we've seen the market overreact many times before. Um, and also the, the, uh, the wage data show that uh, unemployment costs rose uh, about 2%, which is less than the uh, current inflation rate. Um, pl plus, keep in mind that Yellen is uh, perceived as dovish, and so she probably need to see more evidence of a truly recovering economy before taking action. Um, there's, uh, the Fed was saying that there's still a lot of slack uh, in the economy with millions of people um, desperate to take a job. Um, we also have to keep in mind that a lot of people have just dropped out of the workforce entirely, so the current unemployment rate of 6.1% does not reflect that, and tomorrow's unemployment figure will not either. Um, so, you know, those are, those are arguments for why this uptrend may continue. Uh, the uptrend, uh, when I say uptrend, I mean the, the bull market that started in 2009. Uh, these things usually don't just end all of a sudden off highs. Uh, you, you usually you get fair warning. Um, you start to see pronounced weak at weakness in the markets and then attempted recoveries that fail. Uh, this is sort of like uh, late 2007 when we could be in that phase right now where Russell 2000 was um, lagging the S&P and the NASDAQ by a margin, uh, much as it's doing today. Um, but as you know, back then the market didn't just up and crash. Uh, that came about a year later in uh, late 2008. So right now we could be at the early stages of the beginning of a bear market. Um, we're seeing a lot of, um, of course, we've seen a lot of pronounced weakness in leading stocks whenever the markets want to sell off even a couple percent. Um, right now it looks like the S&P is off about 2.5% off its all-time highs and the NASDAQ's off a little over 2%. So this correction could, uh, could deepen and I uh, wouldn't be surprised to see uh, market nervousness cause you know, another one of these uh, corrections that extend to, say, several percent, just enough to scare everyone out, then we have a reaction rally and a resumption of the uptrend. But if the uptrend, if that resumption does not hit new highs in earnest like we've seen before, um, you'll notice on the NASDAQ or the S&P, a fairly consistent uptrend after, after, a, um, after a correction. And the market's had many of these minor corrections uh, over the last couple of years. But you'll always see resumption. And so the question right now, in my mind, in the market direction model's mind and the UVXY's mind is whether uh, the next leg up is going to, is going to um, show that these major indices can indeed hit new highs. Um, and that'll be a big clue for the models um, because as, as I've said and you can see the track record of uh, MDM, it's never missed a major, major um, collapse in the market. It has a perfect track record so far. So, um, and it's simply because the market does give clues before the, uh, the day of doom, before our Armageddon does, uh, does occur. Um, so we're going to watch and see um, what happens next in this uh, exciting uh, scenario as it unfolds. Gil? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, from my perspective, I'm not wait, waiting and watching to see what happens. I already went short yesterday and carried a couple of decent sized short positions overnight. Uh, Yelp I hit yesterday uh, around the 80 plus level on the gap up on earnings. That, that looked really suspicious to me and I didn't think it was going to be another Twitter. Uh, and, and Twitter itself I think is a short. And I was working that short yesterday and came back after it uh, yesterday after the close. I covered my position into the close yesterday that I had taken when it gapped up and then I, I looked at it and later Oh, about an hour before they closed up the uh, after hours trade, I went and shorted it again. Uh, and then this morning, you could just come in and spray shorts on Netflix, Amazon, you name it. I mean, across the board, and everything just collapses. And, and to me, that, that gives you reinforcement on the short side. We'll see how far this break comes. But 
to me, this all of what you're seeing today is like a train that's been coming down the tracks. And if you've been following me on Twitter, I've been posting this picture that I took in Bell Buckle, Tennessee, of a train approaching the intersection from the distance. I figured it would come in handy at some point, and I've been milking it for all it's worth. But I, you know, you look at the Nasdaq here, and you you just I mean, it's not rocket science, you know. It's it's just you see distribution one, two here off the peak. Uh, you see this light volume move to new highs, so running out of gas. You pull back, pick up distribution here, uh, and then let's see, yeah. And then again, you're churning in here, and then you break down. Some of these are, are blue. I don't know why they color code in blue. It's some peculiarity, but. Um, uh, these actually, because it's an up day here, but you notice I, I color code this red because it opens up here and closes down here. So you're just seeing this confluence of, of distribution and churning over the last two, three weeks, pretty much throughout most of July. And to me, that just looks suspicious. And of course, you know, now you see what's happening. They're whacking the market down. It's heading for the 50-day. I'm watching it. Um, We'll see if I decide to cover uh, some of my positions here. If I'm looking at some of these on the handy dandy uh, 620 chart, let's take a look at, say, Yelp, for example. Uh, it's continuing to break down. You had a MACD stretch here right off the opening. Uh, I thought that was coverable, so you know I came and covered it. Of course, it goes lower. Uh, you've got other ones, Netflix getting whacked here. You're starting to get a MACD stretch in here. So maybe you're in a position where you get an intraday bounce. Um, I don't know. All I know is if you hit all these right at the opening today, you've just made a bunch of money, and you can bag it and now see what's going on. But I think you might have more downside in this market from here. That's what it sure looks like. Uh, Dr. K, was there any reason given this morning for the selling? Uh, it was it, is it what's going on in the Ukraine? Is it the Argentinian bond default? Is it the Gaza situation? Uh, what's the excuse du jour? Yeah, of course, it doesn't really matter what the reason no, right, is. No, right, um, I'm just curious, is there a, a reason? No, um, you've got uh, Argentina, Argentin, Argent, or, or Argentina, Argentina is, uh, <laughs> Argentina, <laughs> Argentina, <laughs> Argentina yeah. is uh, having problems with their um, being able to pay their debt. So that uh, sparks a whole uh, chain reaction of worry. And plus, the market, I think, is looking for an excuse to sell off because it's been um, very difficult for the markets to uh, continue uh, the uptrend. It's been going, they've been going sideways, choppy, which is not constructive at all. And we've seen, seen leaders uh, have a tough time of really uh, get, getting started. I mean, you do have uh, some leaders that have gapped up on good earnings because we're, you know, we're just out of earnings reporting season or coming to the end of it. Um, and so that's helped the NASDAQ um, outperform um, as an index uh, because some of these big, uh, big names are doing well. Um, but the, the underlying um, the underlying uh, backdrop is looks a little bit more uh, worrisome, um, you know, in terms of being able to um, really have uh, um, much uh, confidence that this up, uptrend is really going to continue um, before the market puts in some sort of correction. Now, right. the, the long, over the longer term, we don't know. You know, this uptrend right. could certainly continue. Uh, most people predict way too way too soon in advance um, when they try to fight the Fed that the uptrend is over and the bear market has began. But we, like I said earlier, we'll we'll know um, we'll know what happens you know in the ensuing weeks based on the price volume action of leaders in, in major indices. Um, and and one other thing is uh, you know obviously there's many different ways to trade the market, and some people's styles are not to you know um, trade very quickly or swing trade or day trade. Um, I, I do a little bit of everything in this kind of market environment because you have to. But uh, if your style is is a little bit longer oriented, which is true for I think most people, um, then you shouldn't be feeling you know don't fret on a day where you know you have down days like today and and you know don't kick yourself for thinking oh you should have been 100% short or something like that because if it's not your style then you shouldn't beat yourself up over it. But be very very careful about protecting your profits. Um, in, in such an environment so that you don't get back, you know, what uh, you might have made so far this year. Yeah, I would say the way I approach the market is mostly as a swing trader because that's what it's giving you and that's what it's showing me. You see these great moves and you have to be quick on them uh, because the moves occur, like if we look at the NASDAQ here, uh, let's see if I can, can I make this thing fit? Let's see, there we go. 
Um, if you look at the NASDAQ as it was correcting, you saw the low right at the 200-day, but once it sets up like this and it starts to break out through the 50-day, that's really where you're starting to see a lot of uh, roundabout type uh, pocket pivots and, and whatnot. And I think that, uh, let's see here. Give me one second here. I'm watching, I, I shorted VMware around, uh, where is it right now? Around 101 and change this morning. Uh, if you're looking at the five minute, um, hope I remember what, yeah, if you're looking at the five minute of VMware, you can see this, it opened up and then you've got a 620 cell right after the opening, seven o'clock my time, it's, and I just noticed it's jacking to the downside and starting to break apart. Um, that's one of my stocks I've been watching on the short side, even though it has been rallying, mainly because I think this is, you're up into this area here, I think this is probably another right shoulder, and it's probably going to break, so we'll see what happens. But anyways, getting back to um, <clears throat> my original point, is that the, the best moves occur here, and that's a very nice trend to ride, and there are a number of stocks, you know, Illumina had a great move from there, and, and I really think that, you know, th this is the... Uh, the uh, O'Neill Disciple market, as far as I'm concerned, because the pocket pivots are coming around. I mean, these are such a deadly weapon in this market, and they're so freaking effective, it's not even funny. And then when you see the standard O'Neill breakout here, you know, slam, they, they uh, turn this thing into a, uh, I don't think I'd call it a pod. You know, you know, writing the new book and trying to describe pods versus what's really a big, ugly, um, late-stage cup of handle that's failing, uh, you know, you don't want to get too bogged down in the labels. To me, a pod is, is a straight-up, straight-down kind of thing. Uh, you know, like if you look at, say, X1, you know, th this straight-up, and then if this is sort of a pod, it's also a, a late-stage improper cup of handle, but see how it breaks down so rapidly? That's more what you're looking for in a pod, but you get these larger cap uh, pods and stocks, so like you, you see now, Illumina is, is doing this. Uh, Netflix is doing this. Uh, it's starting to fail. And if you look at Netflix, it's really still pretty far up there in its pattern. So uh, it could come down a long ways if it continues to go go lower. You see uh, P is for pounded uh, on a right shoulder rollover. Um, that one's been shortable on the little rallies up into the, you know, yesterday it could have been shorted. You could have hit it this morning right at the opening. Uh, and bingo, you're, you're making some money. It looks like it wants to head lower. Ye yesterday, there was a rumor that uh, AT&T was going to buy Pandora Media. And I'm not sure who's smoking what, but I don't really see how that does anything for AT&T. And I don't understand why they would pay for something that really isn't that hard to... Uh, it doesn't have that many barriers to entry. And I think Apple Radio, for example, I use that on my iPhone. Uh, that seems to you know, be as good, and, and it's already there with my uh, iTunes, so, you know, and my music. Anyways, um, where else are we? Let's see. Hmm, hmm. Looking around. Oh, we got some other ones. Jazz. Here's a here's a breakdown. Um, see, the best place to buy this would have been on the pocket pivots in here. I think there was one in here. Yeah, and uh, coming through here, and, and uh, once it starts to look like it's going to break out, you know, here, the, it gets slammed. And so, you know, the po it's a pocket pivot market. It's not, it's not a breakout market. I don't think it has been for a while. And I think as a market corrects here, uh, if we do see a low and the market's able to turn around, you want to be alert to that and be watching for these types of uh, buy points in patterns. I think as you progress through and the uptrend becomes obvious to everybody, uh, it's... Uh, it, it, everything's long in the tooth at that point, and the market corrects, and that's that's really been the pattern. You move to a marginal high, and then you roll over again. You come in, everybody gets bearish. It bounces off support and takes off the other way. And uh, you know, the one thing with with I find is just so paradoxical about the Fed policy is that you had a four percent, allegedly a four percent GDP growth number in the second quarter. It was announced yesterday, but interest rates are near zero percent. What's wrong with this picture? It's GDP number is all a bunch of BS, and now I hear the next quarter they're going to start adding things like R&D, which adds 2% to GDP. Uh, they're also, uh, although they do uh, currently count pension uh, payments in GDP, currently they're going to stop doing that, and instead they're going to count promises to pay pension payments as GDP, which will also jack it up. So, you know, we live in the world of Orwell, and that's basically what's happening here. Uh, and I and I think you know that that's 
that's where you're at. And the government's going to sit there telling you how you know, everything's okay, but they're slacking the job market. No kidding, they're slacking the job market. Most of the new jobs are part-time jobs. And if you look around, uh, Dr. Kai, I know you're in London, but I, you know, out here in the U.S., I don't see it. You know, I, and, and these idiots on TV talking about how fantastic the economy is, and now we're at a point. I saw somebody babbling about how we're at a point now where the economy can take over on its own. Great, then let's see you uh, raise interest rates. Let's see what happens. Uh, but you're not going to see that because they they can't they can't do it. Uh, anyways, I'm babbling. You got any questions out there? I mean, you're looking at. Um, let me show you some more names. I mean, Amazon. You know that that was a short here. You gap down underneath this area of support. You try to rally up into it. You could short it in there. This morning it was around 320. You could have hit it there. You're down at 313. Uh, let's see on the five minute. You actually had the MACD stretch here. It's trying to turn, but it really can't. I think this thing's going below 300 at least, probably a lot lower. Uh, Twitter's another one. You know, I think Twitter's going lower. That wasn't mm -hmm. a uh, viable gap up yesterday. It was a shortable gap up. Um, Dr. Hey, you didn't like that gap up at ye uh, yesterday at all, right? He, you actually were right on that. And you came right like up to this right. area of, of resistance. Holes in pattern. <clears throat> yeah. So, and the other thing is, like I was saying, if if um, you know, Facebook sells at 45 times forward estimates, uh, Twitter are currently at around a thousand. So, does that mean Facebook needs to go up 20 times, or does it mean that Twitter is probably a two dollar stock? I don't know. But in, in any case, maybe it's not a two dollar stock, but I think it's going back down. It's going to fill this gap. How's that for a uh, radical call? Short GS, I'm going to ask. Short GS. Short anything. You know, I, I even did the, uh, here's my test of how weak a market is. I went and shorted. I looked down on my list. Look, this, the only stock that was up this morning, I went and shorted it when it was up. And that's Eris Group. And, of course, it reverses and comes in about, you know, a buck. So I cover it. But that was just, that's kind of like a litmus test. If you can short the strongest stocks in the market and make a buck pretty quick, uh, that tells you how weak. We're getting weaker right now. We're down 228 and getting slammed. Just getting slammed here. I think you're going to crash, Dr. K. I think we're going to go down well, a thousand I've heard, that, I've heard that many, many times, <laughs> but you know. It's going to happen I mean, someday. You know. uh, well, but, but you know point, what? It, I, it'll, be the first, it'll be a first actually fit crashed off this kind of pattern. Um, and that's based on over 100 years of market history. What about in, in fact, uh, I don't think, I don't wait, think it's wait, ever wait. happened. What about in March 2000? Yeah, we had ample days of warning. That's how we were able to but go to cash. I mean, I was in cash about three or four days off the peak. Right. Every. I mean, and it was, it was so very pronounced. I mean, it was very evident. I think to everyone to get out of the market at that point. Right. I'm going back. I'm going back. I want to see this. Let's. I'm going to make this smaller. You know, and if you didn't get out, uh, that first that first sell-off was brutal. I mean, the, the Nasdaq lost 13% off its peak, just straight yeah. up, and then it made a re weak retest of old highs. So yeah, so no one had any excuse to stay in that market as it started to m move lower. Yeah, so you know, in an environment where we've had so many firsts, here's a nice break off the peak in uh, 2000, early 2005. That's a pretty sharp break. Uh, so that you know, that's one where the market does kind of crack altogether right there. There's here's another. Well, not that's not really one. Here's another. Well, but but right the percentage there, the per great. percentage loss. It's not. A, it wouldn't. I don't think anyone ever called that a crash. Um, no, it's all relative. I mean, I mean, the, the Nasdaq corrected when all was said and done. It corrected about eight <laughs> percent. I mean, not even up that whole yeah, thing. So what would be a crash? Five percent or more on the downside. No, I would say I would say several. If you had one one day where you lost several percent, and then overall, you know, if the if the market say lost fifteen percent in just a few days, that that would be, I'd call that a crash. So tomorrow, then we'll have Black Friday tomorrow. Anyways, let's let's get some more uh, questions going here. I don't know. I just think this looks pretty ugly, and it looks to me like it's been setting up for the last couple of weeks. Even though, you know, admittedly, you can make some money, you know, trading this stock. I bought this off the ten day. It runs up. And, of course, you know, sell into this. Earnings come out today. It's going higher in the faces. That's a pretty strong stock. Um, you know, Tesla is viable off the 10-day. You had a pocket pivot yesterday, but now it's reversing. Earnings come out after the close. This RFMD that we put a viable gap up out on last uh, last week uh, had a almost a 10% move in, in <laughs> three days. 
you know and if you're long that it's like okay what more do you want uh, so I guess you can't get too piggy please define and describe RAPP you're kidding aren't you a roundabout pocket pivot it's you know like like it's when a stock is rounding out its base and you get a pocket pivot like here and it's coming around off the lows of the base and you get a pocket pivot coming up through the can come up the, through the 50 day in this case this one comes off the 50 day and the 10 day 50 days is a blue one the 10 day is this sort of purplish thing and uh, that's a roundabout pocket pivot that occurs in the base and those are much better pocket pivots than uh, or, or those are the pocket pivots you want to be buying rather than buying the bear breakouts. So, you know, if, if you have more questions about that, I would suggest reading our book. Uh, there's also an article. Is that posted on the website, Dr. K, the article we wrote about uh, roundabout pocket pivots, weapons for the QE market? I think it was something like that. Yeah, I mean, it should be um, listed on all the different uh, articles we published. Yeah. Um, I mean, if they look at in the news, in the news, then um, that we should be listing all our publications on that. Somebody says uh, short sock sell has been the trade, uh, has been money for the last weeks, and is a leading indicator. Yeah, that that's telling you too, and you can see that's starting to break. <laughs> but I think also the divergence between the Russell 2000 <laughs> and the rest of the market. If you go back, um, let's see if I can find this. I know I've got it somewhere in here. Here we go. Uh, here's a chart I have. If you go back to, uh, whoa, this is 2007. Is this right? Is that right? That doesn't look right. This is a current one. This is where we are uh, with the Russell right now. And if you go... I know, to, uh, that... So right here's the IWM in 2007 yeah. in October it broke down to the 200 day tried to bounce and then rolled over at the same time the Nasdaq moved to new highs and then when the Nasdaq blew apart uh, the Russell blew apart along with it and everything blew apart and that was the market top and so that's what I remember seeing the Nas uh, the Russell uh, diverging so much but the other thing is is that we also saw I think in a, for a period of time where, let's see where's the uh, S&P chart. I mean, if you look at the S&P, it's been pretty steady. And it started making new highs. You know, it was moving to new highs in mid-May, in the end of May. And at the same time, uh, let's go <clears throat> back to the present. Down 2.30 now. It's getting uglier. I, I think we clear minus 400 on the Dow. It's only, uh, we're not even halfway through the day. This could be exciting. Finally. I think I came back from vacation just in time. Anyways, uh, let's see. Okay. Where are we? We're getting closer. Bear with me here. What will be interesting is the, uh, the, the semiconductor index was um, one of the most lagging in indexes uh, in 2000. And, uh, I think it was in 2000 and. Yeah, late uh, late 2007. So um, again, that so you might and so you know you had a massive divergence with with right. the semis, and so right now it, it's been very strong. Um, so what it'll again it'll, it'll be telling when um, when the markets finish their selling off and they try to rally again if the uh, semiconductors lag as much as they did back in uh, late 2007. Yeah, and you can see we did have a divergence in May as the SP was going to new highs and Nasdaq was still lagging. We weren't sure if that was a problem. But uh, as is often the case in the QE market, everything was able to come out. But I think what you do is you uh, leading stocks for uh, pocket pivots within yes. the base or roundabout pocket pivots. So um, let's see. ANET. I don't know. Sucked you in on the gap up yesterday or the uh, pocket pivot. It's holding up. But, you know, I don't, I don't really like this. It's kind of V-shaped here. You look at the weekly chart. It, it, there's nothing really going on there. I don't know when earnings come out. I think... Not for a couple of weeks, but I don't know. You know, you want to buy it in this environment. I don't think you should be buying anything. Save, and I don't know. I don't. I don't think you should be long anything. Okay. Uh, I dumped all my longs. Whatever I had left, I would take profits into the rise. Maybe I'll hold on to a small core position. But everything, I, I lost everything today. So whatever I had, I think I had some G Pro, I had some RFMD. 
I had Tesla, and I actually sold Tesla at 2.30 this morning in pre-open. Went a little higher, but, you know, better just put that one in the bag, uh, or in the bank, rather. Uh, but I wouldn't be long anything. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if you're long a stock and you're asking us, you know, should you sit with this, my answer is no, get the hell out. You can always buy something back. Don't marry the stock, especially when you got the Dow making new lows and we're down 2% on the NASDAQ and volume is up pretty good. Uh, moving a averages are central to finding areas of resistance for setting up shorts. What about situations where the stock is below all of the moving averages? Amazon, for example. I think I talked about that already. Then you use uh, reference points like technical resistance, which would be the underside of this little flag right here, and that becomes your resistance level. The other thing is, you know, you get up into here, 324, 325, I think, and you're within two, one and a half to two percent of the 50-day moving average. So you're close enough to short it. You know, it doesn't mean it's going to immediately roll over. In this case, it did, but I think it just tells you how weak the market is. So you can use those. Uh, as well. Or, you know, if you want to short them in midair and use it, like yesterday you could have shorted Amazon, use a high of a couple of days ago as a quick stop. You know, if you want to run it really tight, that's generally how I'll do it. I'll just keep coming back and hitting them and coming back. Like today, you know, yet, yesterday I was trying to short Amazon around the 320, 321 level. It didn't really do anything. And then this morning they bring it right up to uh, 320 uh, and change. And you could just, you know, come back and hit it again today, and that's working. So, you know, that's why I like to, to short. I'll, I can, I'm very fluid. I keep moving. Grub. Interesting, Grub is holding up today. It's, so what? What are you going to do? Are you going to pile into it? Sell your wife, your kids, your house, all your valuables, and put it into Grub here because it's up today or, you know, down a few cents in this environment? In this environment, a stock like this will get killed if things get worse. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you you need to buy it. Um, and I don't think it's that interesting. I think being short Yelp is a hell of a lot more interesting. So, or even Twitter, which is now down a buck seventy-five and pushing towards the lows. Um, Dr. K. Dr. K, you still there? I always have been. Okay, good. Just making sure. Uh, when the UVXY buy works, I will think the markets are in a new day, the oceans will start to recede, and the planet will heal. Agree? Huh? So yeah, you, well, that basically, uh, you basically have a, a situation where markets are, you know, been onerous with QE at the helm, and so, uh, you know, these sideways markets are not conducive to trend following. No. Um, and you could, might argue that maybe the uh, the trend following wizards who have these remarkable 25-year track records and um, maybe start actually making money <laughs> once again, um, because they've been collectively down for, I think, since, well, at least since 2011, um, if not 2010 as well. So, you know, in their trading careers, this is, I don't think they've ever been up against something like this. Um, so, yeah, the U, UBXY, like I've said before, some people have done done well with it. I've done fine because I've traded around the core position, as I've said before, and that core position is up about 67% right now. But, um, you know, net, net, you have to also subtract for the other pieces that I've traded in and out of that core position. Um, and there's nothing wrong uh, with taking profits once, you know, UVXY is up, say, 20, 30, 40 percent. Maybe you take some off the trick table. Um, you know, if you follow the model to, to a T, uh, buying and selling, then, you know, you're going to have a lot of volatility in this kind of environment. Um, but again, you know, that might be your style, but you should also be aware that it's not a very user-friendly environment in, far, in terms of trends. So yeah. um, I would... I would say position size very wisely <clears throat> as a result of knowing that, you know, you're up against uh, a stacked deck and the Fed's the one who's dealing. Yeah, and on top of that, you know, trading the VIX, the UVXY, that, that is rocket fuel. If you catch it right, you can make a lot of money fast, but if you don't catch it so right, you can also get hit uh, pretty good if you don't keep things tight. So, you know, understand what you're dealing with, I think. Uh, in that case, but you know, maybe if there's a buy signal that works for good, that means we're going to get a, a really uh, dirty uh, downside break. Maybe, uh, maybe you'll get it when you least expect it. When you become most cynical about it, it's going to work the best. Let's see. The issue I have with the Twitter gap up says somebody is that it closed in the lower portion of its candle. Lots of effort that looks like it was sold into. Right. That's why I said it's a shortable gap up, not a buyable gap up. So, I sure I'm short the stock right now. Also, 
I just don't see what drives Twitter higher. I think it what 33, 34 million shares short in the stock, and you know once all those shorts pull their nads out of their out of the vice on that one, who's left to buy it? I think people just sell it, and they are. So we'll see until until I get some kind of a 620 buy on this thing or something that's telling me that it's time to bag it. I don't really see it yet. Uh, MACD stretch. I don't know. Maybe you're getting close to an area where it's going to bounce, but at this point, I'd probably wait for it to push me out through the 20 period uh, moving average on the five minute here. Um, you are getting this cross here, so. But I, you know, I don't know. That, to me, I think this thing's just heading lower. We'll see if I'm right. Um, Yelp minus 11 percent. Yelp me. Okay, what else we got? It's 9:32. We're only about halfway through today's webinar. So, do we have any? Any more exciting uh, questions? Does anybody have a stock that they think they should buy and they want to know whether we're going to bless it for them? Um, how about a short? Does anybody have anything that's a great short now that hasn't already blown apart? See, when you start getting down this low, this is where I start looking at at least cutting back and covering. But I've already done that in a couple of cases and uh, just kind of watching. Um, you know, this SWKS... I didn't, I didn't like this, uh, and I talked about this in the chat room, and of course, you know, people there want to argue with you, which is fine, I suppose, um, but what I thought here is if you have this kind of a powerful gap up, it, and it holds up like this, and it you know, goes higher the next day, it should hold up pretty good. Instead, the thing pops right back in, you get several days of above average volume. I thought it might hold the 10-day, but I didn't like the way it acted in here. I actually shorted the stock. Uh, in here, and it's coming in. It's probably heading lower. For all we know, it's another caveat. You know, that stock had a nice gap up. It actually ran up for a while. Now it's blown apart, more or less. It's just come in. It's got kind of lost uh, lost its mojo. Do I think LinkedIn is shortable? Well, earnings come out, I guess, when? When do earnings come out on this thing, Dr. J, today? I think after today. Uh, yeah, after today's uh, uh, market. Um, do I think it's short? I don't know. I'm going to watch it after hours. And if they gap it up or something, maybe I'd short it. Or even if they gap it down, I might short it. I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I think it's probably in a shortable pattern. You know, I think you're looking at a Mondo uh, massive left shoulder, big head. You can also see you got a little, you know, head and shoulders thing going on up here when it broke down. This one we were first shorting it. It had a nice move here uh, on the downside. And now you're rallying up into the 200-day moving average. I, you know, I wouldn't be averse maybe to shorting a little bit into the earnings. We'll see. If I'm up big today, uh, say if I get a few more percent on the upside today, I'll uh, maybe I'll think about it. But I, I think it could be shortable. I, I don't really see What's so exciting? You got any thoughts on this, Dr. K? Well, you know, LinkedIn itself, uh, I don't like, uh, you know, the, the pattern is is certainly um, not one that interests me on the long side. Yeah, it could gap up on earnings, but keep in mind that the, the uh, last two earnings reports, actually the two reports before this last one, they were all uh, weak. They were all um, the yeah. result of ga uh, stock gapping down. So, um, you know, and the, the fundamentals on it uh, really don't excite me so much. Um, you know, I think the real leader in the space is going to be Facebook uh, because they've got so many different uh, ways of generating revenue, um, and they command, uh, I think, the majority of the market, much more so than Twitter or, or LinkedIn. Um, and they also, I think, there's a, you know, there's studies about how much time someone spends on Facebook, so uh, which is far greater than on either LinkedIn or uh, Twitter. So the, yeah. Facebook's got a lot going for it. Um, LinkedIn is. You know, go with the best. That, that's always my recommendation. You know, don't look at uh, follow-ons. LinkedIn certainly is the best in its space, but in the social networking space, uh, Facebook commands the most, um, the most audience. Uh, and you know, they, again, it's got a lot of challenges ahead itself. Uh, I'm not saying that Facebook's in the, you know, in the clear here, and it's going to just all of a sudden fiercely uptrend. I'm, I'm not expecting that either. It's a very competitive space, but at least Facebook does have um, an edge over both LinkedIn and Twitter. Yeah, and and Facebook hasn't even held its uh, Bible gap up, so yeah. But you got to think about this. It's kind of a this is late stage, so probably too obvious. Not going to work. Um, let's see. Let's see. I probably missed Chris's answer to my previous question as to what his issue was with the Twitter gap up. 
Um, I think we both had the same issue with it, and basically that. Uh, do you want to you want to go and pontificate on this, Dr. K? Yeah, sure. It's um, you know the last it's, it's had two gap downs in the pattern as a result of um, weak earnings, and then the last earning, of course, the current one was strong, surprised the markets. Uh, but the pattern has has holes in it. So on a technical basis, I'm not really interested in this kind of thing. I mean, I'd much rather be focused on names with with good technicals. Um, and like I said, with the fundamentals, yeah, they're they're looking better. But I would rather go with the leader in the social networking space, which is uh, which is Facebook right now. Right, and it's it's and now it's confirmed as far as I'm concerned. You could use uh, the low 45.50 as a stop on a short. That's probably what I'll do on the core, but I'm, I'm watching this as it comes in. I thought it was a little bit was covered, but we'll see what happens here. Um, FB worth a small long at 10-day moving average here. <laughs> You're not serious, are you? Hell no, I wouldn't touch it. It's a, it already failed on the uh, on the breakout. I, you know, I wouldn't buy the stuck. I, th I think Dr. K may actually have a point this time around. That it's overowned. It's the big, the cap size is way too big now. Everybody on the planet owns it. Everybody loves it. It is a great company, but I would buy this at the 10-day in this environment. You know, close your eyes and and I guess you know stick out your hand and see if you can catch the falling knife. Good luck. Yeah. Well, th this time around, I, I I was pretty bullish on fa I was bullish on Facebook early on. I mean, right. like a year ago, because of the, <laughs> the the platform it's standing on. Um, and uh, you know it's it's proven out so far, but it's a tough one to trade simply because it tends to violate the 50-day. Yeah. So you know it, you got to have <laughs> you got to in this kind of stock you got to just take your profits really when you got them. And it's yeah. also that kind of market environment. Yeah. So you know, and you're trading. What, what are you trading on this thing this morning in terms of volume? You're seven percent above average coming down to the 10-day. You know, may, maybe a bunch of people see it there and they come in and. And cover or, or buy buy some there thing they're going to get a bargain on it, but I don't you know to me it's violated the viable gap up so there's no reason to be buying it, period. Especially with the market getting whack the way it is, just don't see it. Uh, less experienced investors, as a rule, probably shy away from shorting gap ups. Very instructive and a good example. Uh, I, I think you have to look at the gap up itself. I I just didn't buy into this. Neither did Dr. K. It just didn't. You know, for, for reasons he already has gone into and I went into as well in terms of comparing this to Facebook, Facebook 45 times forward earnings estimates, Twitter 1,000. Is Twitter really worth that much more than Facebook in, in terms of the, the potential uh, earnings down the line? I, I don't think so. And I and you're seeing it today, you know, with the stock getting hit. Volume today is 91% above average at this time of the day. You might come down in here. Uh, but the way I saw it, you gap up into this level, this is a point of resistance right here. So it can go a little past it, but um, kind of loses it and uh, just drops right back in. So I think it's coming in. Maybe it heads down to 40, uh, fills the gap all the way, or maybe it comes down to this, the top of this around 42.95, a couple of bucks from here. We'll see. Um, somebody says the 620 chart really helps out in this regard. Yeah, uh, you could use a 620 yesterday. It's not guaranteed to produce, you know, magic result. It's a tool, and I use it that way, and it's contextual, and it's not 100% perfect either. So if you're looking for some magic uh, tool or, or magic indicator, it's going to tell you what to do. Forget it. You know, my, my general view towards trading, and especially the short side, is there's a lot of work, and you you really have to think through it. You have to work out your strategies. You have to stick to uh, tight risk management. You know, I've been hurt in the past when I've been sloppy with that, and, and in this environment, you can't get away with that. Uh, you have to keep things pretty tight, and, and I, I think it's just a lot of work, and as Dr. K was saying earlier, not everybody is fit to, to be a short seller, and but, but I enjoy it, and I'm pretty decent at it, actually. Uh, Especially lately, because I've been able, I've gone through so much experience at this point to refine my techniques, and that, that's all of that stuff's coming out in the next book. Anyways, CRM short with stop 50 DMA or up near 200 DMA. Let me ask it. Okay, so they want to know short here with a stop at the 50. Well, if you were smart, you would have shorted it at the 200-day moving average this morning. Now it's down here, down another buck or so, and uh, 
you know, you want us to bless the trade. I don't know. If it goes lower, then it's a great short here. If it doesn't, it's not. The, the, the key here is, okay, let's just approach it from the practical uh, angle, which is where are your stops if you short it here. Uh, maybe it breaks down through the lows here, and it's toast, and the market, you know, it goes down 500 points today or tomorrow, whatever. But uh, at this point, you are you got a 50-day moving average at 54.70. You're at 54.45. If you wanted to short it, here, you could use that as a stop, but I, I can't tell you that it's not going to shoot back up to the 200-day moving average. So I don't have a crystal ball. So, But that's, you know, that's how you look at it. So if you're asking me, you know, do you wait for the 200-day moving average, you may not get there. If you saw it up there, you could, but it's all hindsight now. So uh, don't... Uh, don't think that there's some certain spot. It could blow apart and just head a lot lower from here, and so a short would be a great thing. If you want to test that theory and you think that's a possibility, then obviously you go by the parameters of the trade, which are uh, you have the 50-day right above, and you have the 200-day about 2% higher, a little more than that, 2.5% uh, higher, I guess, yeah, close to 3. So you're within range if you want to keep a stop on it right there. And it's just a matter of, you know, how you want to handle the trade. I do think that it looks like a head and shoulders. probably is. Uh, you've got left shoulder here, the big head, the right shoulder, and it's starting to look pretty ugly along the 50-day. So, you know, it's it's in short sale uh, land, I guess you would say. But, you know, I, don't, I can't tell you whether 50-day here or the 200-day is the place to short. I think this morning you can see in hindsight that it was. And now you're left with the potential for the thing to rally back up. I, I think I'd watch it and just see where it goes today. And, and if it, you do get a rally, say, closer to 55, you might come after it. Um, anyways. Somebody's having trouble with their audio. Okay, let's see. Any more uh, questions? Let's see. It's watching this market. You see how you got the bounce in Twitter? So I did cover a little bit, but I'm still sitting on some here. Let's see. Let's take a look at this. Whoops. Yeah, you see how you get this turn here? And you can see you get a you get the MACD uh, stretch here where the MACD bars come down. Now you're, you're turning on the MACD in here. So actually you come in and uh, cover some. And now you're bouncing up into the in here, but you haven't crossed yet. So now you're getting a MACD stretch the other way. So now this might be where you come in and whack it again so we'll see I mean you know I'm in a comfortable position today I got a big cushion kind of see where things go put some in the bank um, work some other positions depending on what I see in real time but I think you got to be fluid here um, are Dr. Care the media sources citing the Argentinian thing as, a, as the reason for the sell-off are, are they ascribing a reason for it the only reason I ask is because in my view news is primarily an alibi and you watch really what's happening to the market itself and what you'll see happen is you'll get breaks in the market uh, based, supposedly based on news and, and institutions, and this is what O'Neill used to tell me, that institutions then will sell on that and they use the news as an alibi to sell and then what happens is the news sort of passes or it turns out to not be as bad as, as originally thought, which is almost always the case. The market tends to uh, overreact to news initially anyways and so now you have a rationale for the market to snap back but but if you go back to the top in March uh, you had this is the break on the Ukrainian news right here in uh, late February and then the next day you know Russia was not massing troops on the border after all and and that was a Monday and you gapped up and then you rolled over so but the thing is in here you could see and one of the reasons I became very bearish right at this point as you could already see leading stocks uh, were starting to roll over and get hit right I think we both saw that didn't we Dr. K? Yeah I mean it was it was a bad looking market uh, um, early on but yeah I mean, I mean it's all yeah. about the market looking for an alibi if it's weak it will you know it's funny because it's always been that way I remember you know asking my mom when I was a kid you know it seems like the news sources will find a reason for any for anything you know, right. for, for to explain, oh, it's up because of this or down because of that. But how come? How come the news always gets it right? <laughs> how is that possible? <laughs> right, and I think the market does what it wanted to do, anyways. 
And then, the, but the news then conversely provides an alibi for a rally that the institutions could then use to come back and then sell again. And so what you'll see happen is a break on news and then subsequent uh, rallies that are sold into. And, and what it just seems like to me is that's what we've had over the last couple of days. There's been a lot of news, Israel, the stuff going on in the Ukraine, you know, the plane uh, getting shot down. Uh, and uh, you got the Argentinian thing now and, you know, the, this and that and the other thing. And so I think that for the most part, you know, news is you don't really pay attention to. It. I think it's important to watch how the market reacts on any kind of a rally uh, after the news uh, sort of passes by and dissipates. Somebody says, uh, I bought some GW page off yeah, the that's, what I, that's what I was saying. Um, Sorry, I was just saying uh, that's what I was saying earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's why it'll be interesting to see how the markets rally uh, back, um, you know, when the sell-off is finished. And, uh, you know, if we start to see lagging um, indices like in the SOX index or the Russell 2000 continuing lagging um, and the inability of uh, major averages to just continue this uptrend that's been pretty relentless since uh, the beginning of 2013. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Here's a question. I bought some GWPH off the 50-day moving average a few weeks back. What do you think of the overall pattern of the stock? Well, what do you think of the overall pattern of the stock since you're the one who bought it off the 50-day moving average? So, you know, what, do you, what is there to think here other than to look at the pattern? You see a couple of handle breakout. It's at the 50-day now again and right on top of this breakout. If it fails, you know, you're going through. And uh, yeah, keep your, you, keep your stops you keep real tight on this here. one because I could I could see people you know taking a nibble or you know thinking you know it hasn't pocket pivoted so that that's a warning sign, and this yeah. is the third time it's testing the 50-day. Keep in mind that when, the more a moving average gets tested, the more likely the stock is going to break through it. That's not to say um, it's going to find its feet and start you know going higher again. But I would keep your stops very tight. I wouldn't wait for a violation of the 50-day. I would just. I would be selling it if it, you know, right now the 50 days at 83.56, and the stock's at 84.63. I would be probably a seller of this if it went down to like 82.99. You know, I mean, very tight. So uh, at this level, I mean, you're only going to be risking maybe you know a couple percent. Because when yeah. it goes through that 50 day, it's gonna it's gonna cut through it, possibly cut through it like a knife. Yeah, and if I owned it, I would just sell it because of the general market environment. Uh, because I, I don't need to be uh, surfing in waves that are going the opposite direction. You know, I've never been to, been able to catch a wave uh, that's coming into shore. I've never been able to ride it going out to sea, so I'm not even going to try. Um, let's see, any more questions? Somebody says, uh, Dr. K, uh, they, they see why you like London, was there last week on vacation, they better look to the right when stepping off a curb. Those damn buses drive six inches from the curb. That's so somebody, uh, we had a subscriber in, uh, okay, my order system just uh, hit all my trailing stops and I covered all my shorts, so I'm in cash. So we, here we get the little bounce here, we'll see what happens. I'll have to come back and take a look at everything. But nice, nice day so far, and we're not. We're just about halfway through, a little over. Uh, headline: Chicago PMI collapses to 13-month lows, biggest miss on record. Yeah, so 4% yeah. GDP. Sure, Ben. This is a, another thing I think is an issue, Dr. K, uh, which maybe we can debate. I don't know, uh, depending on how you feel about this. But you know, the idea is that QE will just continue to push this market along. And everything's going to be fine. The Fed will just, and if things weaken, you know, and I heard someone talking about this, say that Yellen is ready to do whatever she needs to do to keep this economy going. Uh, it's kind of like saying, you know, you got a patient that's on life support systems uh, on the in the uh, uh, critical care unit, uh, and and uh, you know they're going to keep it on life support machines as long as possible. It doesn't change the fact that it's still dead and might still die. But anyways, yeah, uh, you, know, you know, this is. I like I like all these things that have just been thrown up, thrown out thrown um, on the table right now. Um, you know, you got the Chicago PMI, which is showing a lot of weakness. But just earlier today, uh, the markets were concerned that uh, this, there were a couple of uh, reports showing strength right. in the economy, and that was a uh, cause for concern that uh, that's going to prompt the Fed to um, hike rates sooner than expected. But you know, with the Chicago PMI being so weak, I don't think the Fed really 
there's going to be enough evidence, I think, that, that the Fed's going to have to delay hiking rates, um, you know, for, for longer yeah. than even they think. Now, and, but and, what happened? The market wants to market wants to sell off. Um, it market right now is at this juncture, it's in a weak weak place. But that's not to say it won't find its floor, say five percent off its peak, and then start start going higher again. The question is, yeah, the, uh, I've I've often said, you know, the economy is, uh, it, it, you know, the Fed pumps pumps money in the economy, which is like, uh, you know, pumping morphine into a critically ill patient. And uh, meanwhile, you, they're not working on the disease. The disease is running rampant, um, but they think you know making the patient feel better is going to make the patient better. And of course, it doesn't. The patient eventually dies. So the question is, how long? How long can they continue to pump morphine and you know money into the economy um, before we really see a major top? Um, and a, as a result, uh, central banks' hands are tied because they've been printing and mass for a number of years now. And if that's not going to do it. You know what is what will actually right. actually do it. You can right. see some substantial corrections as a result of this. Um, right. What if we things get a lot worse? Quite exciting in terms of uh, the you know these, the, you know when we finally get that kind of break, that that means there's a dislocation from QE and a per potential restoration of uh, more normal market environments. Um, you know, 2008 was great for the model. The model loved 2008 because you didn't have QE in the system and it was able to detect all the selling pressure, so it was able to go to sell signals and and reap the rewards. You know, I think the model is up something like close to 40% in 2008. Um, so, you know, and that I think that was just trading the triple Qs. If you were trading, um, you know, they didn't have three X ETFs then, but if you're trading those, you would have been up over 100%. So I, I'm I'm hoping for a return to normality of some sort, um, and that's why I say maybe this is an exciting time for us because it represents a changing of the guard. Well, my, my point really is simply if the Fed has interest rates near zero and the economy, uh, even the global economy and the U.S. economy in particular, continue to slow and show become weaker and weaker, what do they have left? They have, they have no, you know, they got nothing to pull on at this point. Um, there's no slack in the line, basically. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. And, and so, you know, that, that could do it. So... But, you know, ultimately, as a trader, you know, what happened in 2008, 1999, 1990, whatever, I, I don't really care. I, I need to know what's going on right now, what I need to do right now to make money. And hypotheticals, as far as I'm concerned, as a trader, don't work. So I think what you're seeing right now is a market that's seriously in trouble. And you have a number of uh, short sale target stocks that I've had that are getting whacked. And, and there's a whole number of them. Trip on a uh, you know late stage fail breakout is coming down Illumina on a late stage fail breakout is coming down Netflix on a late stage fail breakout is coming down Coors is coming down Amazon is coming down uh, you got this the P getting pounded uh, Yelp is getting pounded I mean they're all over the place so what this is telling me right now is the right place to be in this market is on the short side um, or in cash if you don't like to short. So that's all I can tell you right now. Where this thing goes, we'll see over the next few days. But I wouldn't get locked into a rigid point of view one way or the other. And, uh, I, you know, I just try to stay in the present, and uh, that takes a little bit of work. But I think that's the key, staying in the present. So I don't really care, Dr. K, what happened in 2008 and what might happen and, and all this other stuff um, and what the model did and what environment, you know, what happens today? What happens right now? How do I make money? You got an answer for that one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that, you got to be in the Zen. You got to be in, yeah. I mean, that, that that goes without saying, no matter what market you're in um, and what you're doing, I think that goes without saying about life in general, you know, just to yeah. stay in the now. Um, Eckhart yeah. Tolle wrote a few great books about about that philosophical concept and I think everyone who hasn't read it, anyone who hasn't read it should read um, A New Earth. I think that's his best work and most comprehensive as well. And it's just, um, it, it, when you when you pick it up and you start reading it, it's a page turner. You're, it's going to be hard to put down because you'll find yourself agreeing profoundly and profusely with uh, with the things that he says in there and his insights are you know just beautiful. So I'm not surprised that that book I think has been translated in what, over 50 languages now? Just incredible. But yeah, it's great, great food for thought for traders or uh, people in any profession. Um, yeah. And you know, as far as 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I always like to see uh, comparisons. You know, we were just earlier today making comparisons to the Sox and the lagging uh, Russell 2000 and 2007 and all that. And that's instructive um, to a point. You know, that's why we do it uh, as traders. And, um, you know, it's good for, I like to know, you know, it's comfort to know to some extent, you know, what my model's been able to achieve in terms of, you know, nailing every down, big down, downturn. But that doesn't make me lazy. I won't say, oh, well, the, the model is in, infallible and it's <laughs> never going to miss a big downturn. You know, that, that's, uh, your, that's the ego getting ahead of itself. Um, so, you know, one else always have to, has to be careful that they, uh, right. they, they remain humble to the, the, the market gods because well, but, you know, if anything's going to throw anyone, it's going to be the markets. You know, they're always uh, going to throw a curveball. And we're in the middle of a curveball right now. Someone want, is asking if you could re repeat the name of the book that you were talking about. It's called A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. A New Earth, yeah. G-O-L-L-E. <clears throat> Eckhart Tolle. Tolle. T-O-L-L-E. -L 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 -E. Oh, wait, two L's. Um, let's see. TRN had great earnings yesterday, but stock didn't hold up. Is it a short setup now? Um, it, it's failing on the breakout. I don't know if it's necessarily shortable here. Maybe it is. You know, maybe it's going to blow apart. Uh, short it and let me know how you do. I, I can't tell you. I mean, it looks like it's failing, but it's at the 50-day. Maybe if it bounced back up to 45, that might be an optimal point to uh, nail it. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I think it's just, you know. What's happening? Everything's getting hit. It was interesting, though, that they went down yesterday on a good earnings announcement. GBX went up, but no pocket pivot and no reason to play here. Um, anyways, uh, it's pretty much 10 o'clock. I'd like to get back to trading, frankly. Um, I took profits. Now we're see if we lift here and see where I can come back in or something else new is happening. But for the most part, uh, this market looks like poop. What's your, would you agree with that assessment, Dr. K? <laughs> yeah, that would be my scientific <laughs> assessment, exactly. <laughs> Do-do, deep doo-doo. Um, yeah, anyways, um, you know, I, 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 you pine for the days when we return to uh, normal trends. What if we never do? What if, what if the market just stays screwy like this and it's a well, street trader's market? What, what do you do then? What, you I, know? I, the market's, the only thing that, uh, that changes is, well, the only thing that doesn't change is change. There's always going to be change. Um, you never get static markets that just stay in the same shape. I mean, that's what makes the markets infinitely interesting and fascinating. So, um, you know, I've studied hundreds of years worth of market data just because I've been interested in studying bubbles, you know, going back hundreds of years, and et cetera. And markets always change. Um, I, think, I think the only way the markets could stay the same is if there was some massive uh, ravaging virus that wiped out most of the human race. You didn't really even have markets anymore. <laughs> then I suppose for all intents they would be static and dead. <laughs> but as long as they remain uh, alive, I think uh, change is just part of the equation. And right. the QE uh, equation is going to come to an end at some point. You know, there's, they may be able to milk this for, you know, who knows, maybe another couple of years. Um, you know, 2010, 2011, you know, when the markets had huge uh, ruptures to the downside, you know, it was easy to point the finger that QE is over. It's done. The Fed's done. Um, but, of course, the Fed, uh, the money printing continued. And, um, you know, the, the central banks are, are pretty, they're very manipulative in terms of what the outcome they're looking for, even if, if, if it costs, even if there's a big uh, pay, price to pay at the end of, uh, of this uh, prolonged Fed party. So, um, you know, the longer this goes, I think the bigger the price uh, that's going to be paid at the end of it. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a lot of smart minds out there that, that are, you know, very concerned about the, the situation that we're in. Um, Jimmy Rogers, of course, is a big mouthpiece. He's always on the news. He's talking about how, you know, the Fed just done every, everything wrong and how they need to reverse what they're doing. But that's not going to happen because they're a political body rather right. than uh, an econ economic one. So, right. you know, the best we can do is just uh, watch the, the, the markets in real time, um, staying in the present and uh, acting accordingly. Very good. I think on that note, there are no other questions. And, uh, oh, yeah, someone mentions there's also the Ebola thing. So, you yeah, know, throw all the news together and it's this terrible world out there. We should all commit Harry Carey and uh, just, yeah, just give up on it. Anyways, uh, nah, I think I'll just short. Okay.
that's all we have for today. If you have any questions, as usual, you can email us at, uh, what, what is the email address? Info at uh, virtueofselfishinvesting.com? Info at, yeah, that's okay. a good one. Or subscriptions at virtueofselfishinvesting.com. Or support, support yeah, at virtueofselfishinvesting.com. Whatever, and uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions. Anyways, you guys, have a good day uh, today. Hopefully you're making some money on the short side. Uh, if you've been following me on Twitter in the chat room, uh, and we'll just see where this goes. So looking pretty ugly. Anyway, stay tuned. We'll catch you guys later. So long, everyone.